Um, and I guess, since we have the floor, let's talk about DEI. Um, in the HB1, there's a provision in Article 3, Section 59, and I'd ask you to pull that, that talks about DEI. And I want to make certain we have this conversation because there's a DEI bill that's making its way through the, the legislative process also. And if for some reason the DEI bill doesn't pass, then the language in the budget controls expenditures of funds. Would you agree with me? The, the DEI uh, rider in the budget will pass along with the budget. Then we have separate policy that you just mentioned, which is legislation that we're in final uh, negotiations to wrap up with the House for the DEI policy itself, the bill. And, and then um, you mentioned another provision of the... Of I haven't gotten to that one yet. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, is that then if the DEI policy passes, then that becomes the law of the state of Texas. That's right. And, and the rider is just in the budget. That's correct. We have a rider in the budget and we have a separate bill for policy. And I have not seen, and I don't think any of us have seen other than those persons that are probably on the conference committee, what the language, well, let me ask a question like this. Does the language in, I think it's Senate Bill 17, does it mirror the language in the budget? The DEI language in the budget. No, there's not an exact mirror because it's one is on policy and the other is specific to, to, to budget allocations. Okay, but in terms of the areas that the policy goes to, are those the same areas that the budget go to? That is in terms of programs, DEI programs and activities. Yes, they reconcile. Okay, so, but you, have you had a chance to compare the language and the policy? with the rider in the budget? Well, I've, I've if got... if you have it, don't worry about it. We can always... I've, I've got the rider right here, but yes, it's... Uh, I mean, I, what I would say, as far as the, the budget rider, it's defunding the DEI units where the policy speaks uh, specifically to uh, faculty hiring. You would agree with me also that the language in the rider is pretty broad, uh, more specifically, if you look at the last sentence in the writer, it says this prohibition includes, without limitation, the hiring and supervision. So it includes without limitation, which means it's broader than just hiring. Would you agree with that? Well, I, I think it must say that because when for the employees that are hired, uh, there are additional provisions in the policy related to a ban on mandatory training and other things, so supervision of employees must be uh, reconciled in both because there are circumstances where hiring takes place, of course. Okay, let me ask you this question, and I know that you're not the author of the writer. Does it include historically underutilized business programs that universities uh, have? Does this writer prohibit historically underutilized business programs? Well, Senator West, if it's a DEI, if it's defined as a DEI unit, uh, and, and it's, those programs are tied to a DEI unit, but no, I, I don't believe if those programs are separate from diversity, equity, and inclusion units, then it would not include it. And those programs existed before DEI ramped up in universities, so. But if those programs are under the, I guess you could say, uh, office of DEI, then would those programs be banned based on your policy and this writer? The policy. In, in terms of, in, in ter let me let me be more specific. If you're right, hub programs have been in existence prior to DEI programs. However, in terms of how universities decide to structure the management of those programs. Some of those programs, and I don't know for certain, may be under DEI offices. And so my question is, if you have such a program at a university and it's under a DEI office, would that program then be subject to 
would be prohibited based on your policy, 17, and this rider. Is, they would need, I, I would assume, I mean, you and I would have to, to look into the, the sort of the granular aspect of what you're asking, but I would assume it would be decoupled from that DEI unit if it's funded uh, as a strategy through those DEI units, as it would have been before the ramp up and the creation of most of these DEI units across the state uh, on university campuses, but that's not the intention. Obviously, as long as it's separate as a program from uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion unit, as it probably was before, it can be decoupled and, and funded some other way. But if it's funded uh, as a result of funding going to a DEI unit, then it would be affected. Say that again. If the strategy that you mentioned under those programs relies on uh, DEI units as a coffer to receive funding through the budget, well then they would be affected, so they would need to decouple. Okay, and, and, and thank you for your explanation. So if you have a DEI office and an employee of that office is responsible for the HUB program, does that employee's position, assuming passage of the DEI prohibitions in the state of Texas, that would end up going away, correct? It, as long as they're uh, truly dedicated to, to, to that program that was really just, if it was under the umbrella, but it existed prior and it doesn't carry out DEI activities as we uh, stipulate in the policy, I, I, don't, I don't see why there's an issue with the distinction. Okay. I understand what you're saying, that a lot of structure was created under the DEI framework as it's grown and ballooned. And I mean, University of Texas alone has 379 DEI employees uh, earning salaries up to $10 million in the aggregate. So there's been a lot of shuffling, putting things under the umbrella of DEI programs. They would have to go back to the structure that they were under prior to that without uh, the with, with, without the, the DEI unit and its okay. strategies being included. Okay. And that, and, that, will and that, would apply. To, that will continue to be under review by the regents going forward is continuing the effort to identify, abandon, and defund any DEI units. So as long as those programs you're talking about that are mutually exclusive don't have those goals, priorities, and strategies, they'll be fine. Okay, so that would apply to recruitment and admissions also, correct? That would apply to uh, faculty recruitment in the policy, correct? Yeah. As it relates to student recruitment and admissions, as long as those programs can be decoupled, as you indicated. For admissions, yes. From and I, DEI, I, yeah, that I, they would be permissible, correct? I, yes, you and I have had many exchanges on this on the Senate floor, but if they would deploy the current money that they're using for all those salaries in DEI for outreach, to, uh, to, to the students that we really need to be recruiting across this state, the, the, the talent that they offer. I, I think we'd see much more su success on that side. But again, the, the, the legislation is about faculty hiring, not admissions. Okay, I wanna ask you one other question. And I, I, I think the question should go, to, and if the chair thinks she should answer it. Um, in Article Three, you know, we had this long discussion about athletes going to these schools and the, the, the argument ends up being you want my athletes but you don't want my my engineers students who want to be engineers and the DEI is going to impact the university's abilities to do recruitment because of the perceived or real culture that will now engulf all our universities because of lack of DEI type activities in the state of Texas and other universities throughout the country will still have these programs. And so we talked about this and in terms of the impact that it's gonna have on the perceived culture of our universities now. After having made some strides, some, I understand we hadn't made the strides we need to, but it's gonna have some perceived adverse impact. We have in the budget, under Article 3, Section 9, 
a provision that basically says that intercollegiate athletics are not subject to DEI programs. And I, I think I've shared that with you, the chair and the president. Help me to understand why it wouldn't be applicable, the DEI prohibitions wouldn't be applicable to intercollegiate athletics, but applicable to other areas of employment on the college campus. I'll answer the question. I, you mentioned uh, the chair, but I, I think it's certainly appropriate uh, to, for us to continue our dialogue on it. I, I think that uh, the, the provision that you mentioned on the dais is that you mentioned uh, Section 9 of Article 3? That is right? correct. Yeah. So it, it, the discussion that we had a little bit earlier, Senator West, was related to concern there. Look, you, you mentioned uh, negative perceptions. I'm, I'm assuming that you're implying that that uh, there, there might be some, some negative perception on uh, our efforts to remove DEI and how it affects college. Frankly, they already are. Yeah, well, I, I, would, uh, I would say that, that uh, my recommendation is don't add to that. Because if the- Well, then we shouldn't pass Senate Bill 17. I won't, we wouldn't well, add to it. I, I'm saying that as we seek more diverse outcomes by removing DEI, which has been exclusive and anti-free speech, and we can- Talk about that some more. We, we, we went through a lot of examples as I stated my case. And you and I are talk, talking about where to go from here. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But I, I don't think adding to any narrative that's destructive or negative related to how it affects or, or reflects on intercollegiate sports for the state of Texas. I mean, I think that the rhetoric matters in talking about how our goal with removing DEI units to achieve more diversity is a wonderful goal. And it's all about how you explain it. So if you launch that type of rhetoric into the media, that will be couched because they feed on negativity. Well, I, I'll do respect. I've been doing this for 30 years. And every, every time we turn around, we have a new program or a new initiative that doesn't, doesn't do diddly squat, okay? Now, and as you and I have talked about it, and we're talking about the budget, so we need to get back to the budget piece. Um, I look forward to working with you on these issues. But again, and I, I appreciate uh, the conversations we've had, but the question is, is are we going to do something or just keep on doing the same thing we've been doing? Let me get back to this initiative, because I know Chair wants to get back to her budget. Under Section 9, Yes. It says in the budget that DEI is not applicable to intercollegiate athletics, which would be football, basketball, and all those programs. But you're saying that in Senate Bill 17, it will be, it will be applicable to athletics. Is that correct? Uh, correct. And we don't put any, uh, with explanation, right, we don't put any funding into intercollegiate athletics now. So the provision that you mentioned that precludes any DEI funding uh, in, in the rest of the budget except for these provisions under set, Section 9, Article 3, dealing with athletics, uh, that's, that, th th those really reconcile because we don't put any funding into intercollegiate athletics through the state budget as it, you know, as it exists today. So it is dollar for dollar a zero impact however you interpret Okay, that's uh, the, the two policy. provisions. I'm, talk, I'm talking about the policy part, though. Yeah. I'm talking about the policy part. If your bill does not become law, then this rider in here ends up being what the policy is, even though there's no money attached to it. Correct? Uh, on its own, uh, that's how the rider would work. But again, we're, exactly. putting, we're putting a bow on the legislation and it's headed to the governor's desk. We've wrapped up our negotiations on the bill. So the policy will pass, the budget will pass, the rider will travel, all of it reconciles, and we're in a good place as, as far as legally how we're proceeding. Okay, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Th Madam Thank Chair. you, Senator West.